If you listen to the show, you already know that we cannot exist without our sponsors. They are the ones who make things happen behind the scenes. So let's acknowledge Fuji Sports. We've been working with these guys for a while now, not only as far as this podcast is concerned, but also at the Roll Academy. We've had their gear. I personally use their geese. What a phenomenal product. Yeah, I mean, jujitsu, judo, MMA, um, tape, bags, anything you need for your jujitsu journey you can find at fujisports.com. Let's talk Roll TV. There's so much content on there. It's ridiculous at this point. But I think what is even more intriguing, as time went on during the project, we've been recording most of the events that were taking place here at Roll Academy. At this point, I mean, we have guys like Chris Howder, Armin Fadi, Rafael Lovato Sr., and, and Pete the Greek. I mean, there were so many different events that we've kind of recorded it. Don't you think that's amazing? I mean, it's points of reflection and kind of going back for all the students to see what really happened and refresh their memory. Yeah, I think it's great, you know, being able to go back and look at all these high-level practitioners, uh, Octavio Kudo, like uh, one of the names you didn't mention. And I mean, just these guys that have been doing this for so long come in, uh, teach these amazing seminars and workshops, and it's all recorded and there for you to watch. Yeah, absolutely. So if you want to get an additional savings on all this, type in code ROW Radio at the coupon and get additional 30% off of your membership. Nice. Go to rollacademy.tv. What's up, everyone, and welcome back. If you haven't already, please remember to hit the like, share, subscribe, download, listen, and whatever other button there is, and leave us a review wherever you do listen. That ensures that we can continue bringing you the great guests and amazing content that you have come to expect. Today's guest is one of the most influential martial artists of his generation. He is trained with martial arts legends Judo Jean LaBelle, Benny the Jet, and the Machado Brothers. John Will is a member of the Dirty Dozen, and is in fact the man who coined the phrase for the first 12 non-Brazilians to earn their BJJ black belts. On this episode, John shares incredible stories of traveling the globe to train various martial arts, including some that have become dead arts. Here is the Roll Radio with the first Australian BJJ black belt, author, world traveler, and instructor for various military and law enforcement agencies, including the Australian Delta Force, and at Quantico, Virginia, John Will. Welcome to Raw Radio. And we are live. Here we go. Would you ever imagine that we would be spe- spending the night on Valentine's oh, Day together? Yeah. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, our guest. Ho- ho- hopefully, our guest isn't forced to celebrate that. <laughs> I think uniquely. American Listen, holiday. We, we've done these but, um, early in the morning. We've done them all throughout the days. But yeah. I think this is a first, right? I mean, it, uh, well, Valentine's Day, yes. <laughs> uh, we've we've done a couple about this time of night, but not 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 many. Not um, many. Well, this one definitely, I think, is worth it. This yes. is going to be interesting. But how is your Valentine's thing going? Is is it? Well. it I mean, <laughs> you hanging so, out with me? Yeah. Uh, it, so this will take a little bit longer than our, I told our guest it would. But how? So. Um, yeah, so you scheduled this. You asked if we could do it on a Tuesday night. I said, sure. You sent me the date. I said, you know, that's Valentine's Day. You said we can cancel. And, yeah, it was, no, uh, we're not going to cancel. Uh, I let Margaret know. Um, and then uh, you and I were in a, in a meeting, uh, Google chat today. And uh, you told her to have a nice Valentine's Day. And she said she could because somebody planned a podcast for tonight so i'm glad that she treats you the same way i do yeah well you know we love margaret shout out to margaret she's the best she is the best she's absolutely 100 percent the best there's no denying that so um, well well without further delay yeah let's bring our guest and let's do this uh professor john will in the house i mean you know first of all we appreciate you being here and um as i was mentioning before we start recording this the seventeen hour change time change you know was messing with me, <laughs> so I appreciate your patience <laughs> with me um it didn't appear to me Se- counting seventeen hours ahead was was difficult, but you know i I miscalculated a few times so <laughs> thanks for being here thanks for th- joining us for this conversation today oh yeah, my pleasure yeah, and you do need a PhD in math to work out the time zone difference and it's also 
not the same day. So yeah. Right. Yeah, well, so and I think that that's what messed me up. That that's really yeah, what threw me off. <laughs> yeah, like I knew it was 17 hours ahead, but I couldn't cut, like it didn't hit me that it's the next day over there. <laughs> so <laughs> So happy Wednesday. What's happening in the future? Anything we need to know about? <laughs> <laughs> you, you got the head start. <laughs> That's right, we do. We hear all the shit before you do. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyhow, your um, you know, you your your history is quite rich. Um, you know, you you know, for those who you know been under the rock and you don't know who you are. I mean, you know, f- phenomenal jujitsu history, such a rich martial arts history from the beginning. Many consider you a pioneer. Um, would you agree with that? Is that something that really um, sits heavy on your mind? No, I, I don't think I'm a Pine. Well, I mean, by accident, by yeah, accident. not not through any not through any planning, right? Like when <laughs> someone's doing something for the first time, no one's paying attention. You're just this crazy person going off on some tangent, and then you look around 35 years later and go, "Oh shit!" A few people are following in the trail. I mean, if people want to call that a pioneer, sure, but I certainly didn't think of it that way. I was just busy doing my own stuff and making weird choices. But it's okay, so how coincidental all of this was. I mean, you are one of the very first non Brazilian black belts, and and you know, you say that it was all sense, you know, a set of coincidences or it wasn't planned, but I mean, there had to be some kind of passion, path, thought behind all of this. You've been on the mat for so long. Well, there was passion, that's for sure. I mean, I started by, you know, it had a martial arts history like a lot of other people, taekwondo, karate, and I did some wrestling in high school. And when I turned 17, I left Australia and went and basically spent a lot of time in Southeast Asia, training all through Indonesia, India, Thailand, and so forth. Probably for 10 years, I was just going back and forth for 10 years doing that. Um And in that time, I cobbled together Australia's martial arts magazine, which back then was called Blitz. Mm -hmm. And um, like our version of Black Belt magazine, but with, you know, one fifteenth of the population. So it it made me enough money to feed myself. That's about it. And and then as editor, owner, you know, it was just a one man band. It was a Commodore sixty four in my lounge room. Uh, <laughs> in the whole magazine. I remember, by the way. I, I remember yeah, Commodore sixty four. That's baby back then. That was a machine. It was awesome. <laughs> so I made this magazine, and and as part of that, I was obviously on the lookout for stories. You know, like like you are, like on the lookout for just things that were a little unusual. And there was a guy from Brazil out here surfing in Australia, where we live near a famous surf beach called Bells Beach. And um, uh, there was a guy from Brazil, Marcelo Badin, who you, you might have heard that name. Mm-hmm. He was out here and he offered a um, $50,000 winner-take-all prize money. But this is back in 1985. I mean, first of all, who had $50,000 in 1985? You know, that a house, you could buy a house for twenty. So, so it was a crazy thing, but it obviously it caught the attention of the public. And I wrote a little piece about that. And no one, of course, no one took up the challenge, but that's what piqued my interest and got me finding my way down the rabbit hole that is BJJ. So, yeah. So, so, at which, so at which point are you stepping on the mat for the first time? 1986. 1986 is where I, when I first, um, I went to America and in an effort to find out more about BJJ, I found my way to Horry and Gracie's garage in Torrance. Yep. Uh, and there weren't many people training at that time. Um, there was no public classes. There was just private tuition. And I think twice a week the private students would get together and roll for fun. So I think I had my first class in early 1986 and then um, – you know, I did five lessons with Horry and Gracie um, because that's all I could afford. I had no money and the lessons were very expensive So compared to what I was used to. So I was used to free training in Asia, you know, you don't pay for training. So, uh, yeah, it was expensive. So I only could do five, but I came back to Australia after doing the five lessons and I, 
you know, I fought as many jiu -jitsu, Japanese jiu-jitsu, black belts and judo guys and karate, whoever I could find. I go, let's have a go. Spa, took them down, got on the mount, stayed on the mount, arm bar or back choke, you know, you, like you could imagine. Yeah. And thought I should do 10 lessons. Like <laughs> I'm having this much success with five. I think I should do 10. And I went back there maybe about six months later um, when I saved up enough money, I went back there and I went to do, I went to ask Horian, where should I go in Brazil? Cause I'm going to go down to Brazil and train figuring it's free down there. Cause it's you know third world country back then. It wasn't, but um, he, he, I turned up for the lesson to talk to him about that. And his cousin, Hegan Machado was teaching there. Hegan was only 18 years old, I believe. And he taught me a lesson and I love that lesson the most. Like he really taught me and he couldn't speak a word of English. So without the, with the language barrier, he still gave me like the best jujitsu lesson I'd ever have. And he was passionate, you know? So I think that, you know, how that passion, that connection. Yeah. That connects. Yeah. And we made, and he said, he made out enough words with the dictionary. He said, don't train here. No good. <laughs> Go to Brazil. You know? <laughs> so, um, uh, I, went, I said, oh, I, that's what I want to do. And he said, I'm going on Wednesday, dictionary, dictionary, come with me. So, and so that's how it all started. Yeah, yeah. So you're not kidding, really, when this is complete, almost complete coincidence. But before you came to U.S., and so you're doing some research on stories about jiu-jitsu, so you have knowledge of what jiu-jitsu is, but you, are, no. you haven't experienced it yet. Is, am I right on here or no? I didn't have any knowledge. I, I thought it was some version of capoeira. <laughs> I didn't. I, didn't know. So, I, I just thought it was Brazilian. So, with that in mind, you come to US and you step in on the mat for the very first time. What is your expectation when you're stepping on the mat? This is your first I, class. Yes, I thought I'd do better than what I did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your I'm honesty. Sure, I'm sure a thousand other people have said the same thing. <laughs> uh, because I, I trained a lot in martial arts, so I thought that's got to count for something. <laughs> <laughs> but, but also, I had done. I, I'd probably I'd had my share of fights by that time, um, and you know I, I'd had like my dozen fights here in Australia. But I'd had a few more than that in Southeast Asia because some of the work I was doing um, to help myself to to buy food and pay for a board and stuff like that was helping the police um, do drug busts and stuff because I was a white guy and I could speak the language. So, you know, they come and approach me, hey, well, you want to go out and set this guy up? And then, you know, when he shows you the stuff, smack him, jump on top and we'll come out of the bushes and we'll arrest everyone. So that's the kind of shit I was doing. Wow. So I was getting into a few. <laughs> and it went south a number of times. It went pear you know, imagine. <laughs> anyway, so that's why I did I want, when I say I got into some fights, I'm talking about that circumstance. I'm not yeah. out there in getting into fights. And um, to, and every fight I got into, almost not every fight, but pre, no, almost 90% or something ended up the same way, despite all my kicking and punching and all the Taekwondo black belt and karate and the silat and all that stuff would end up be takedown, mount, ground and pound. So, and that, that worked for me. Um, because probably because I'd done some, you know, uh, freestyle wrestling when I was in high school, not in school, in the local church hall. We don't have a wrestling program in Australia in the school system. Oh, okay. Like you do in, like they do in the States and Canada. We don't, we don't do that. So I was doing some wrestling. And so therefore I just, you know, when, when it turned shitty to fight, um, I mean, that's code for me getting hit. <laughs> <laughs> um, when it turns shitty, because if you're hitting someone, you don't take them down. You just keep doing that. So you only end up grappling when you're the one on the receiving end. Then you go grapple to make it stop and you go to the ground and then you finish. So that had always worked for me in fights. So I thought back to a question when I step on the mat, well, that'll work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it didn't, you know. So what happened? happened? What happened that first day? Well, his promo class was um, mount on top of me, see if he can stay on, and, you know, you're off 10 seconds later. And then the reverse of that, now I'm going to lay down, you see if he can stay on, I mean, the other way around. He's on me, get me off, and you can't, and then he chokes you out or armbars you or back chokes you. And I, 
I thought, shit, that's that's like awesome. Like I want to do that. I want to do that. Like, and then I saw my a friend of mine, a guy you probably heard of, Gene Lavelle. Yeah. Oh yeah. And um, so I, I was training at the Jet Center, doing some kickboxing and stuff too with Benny Akides and um, Gene Lavelle was there, and I he, he invited me around to his house for dinner. Uh, this is like day two, and um, I said, "Hey, Gene, like these Brazilian guys, like they're doing this choke, you know, it's it, back choke. It's like in wrestling, pro wrestling. Yeah, the sleeper. I mean, is it the sleeper hold? Is what it was. <laughs> and I said, Gene, isn't that all bullshit? And he goes, Really? Come here. <laughs> <laughs> Out I went, and so I, I buy that. Um, so. I think it was a combination of Horian's control. Sure, he did the back choke, but he didn't finish it, whereas Gene was very happy to oblige and put me unconscious. <laughs> and so it was a combination of that that I thought, oh, wow, this is magic. <laughs> like, I, I want to learn this. Like you can choke people when they go to sleep. And um, so so Gene LaBelle was instrumental, actually, in in me seeing you know, because most BJJ classes, you might learn a back choke. You know, you stay on the mount, they turn over, they give you the back, you take the back and you learn the back choke. It's it's always there in your first three months of training somewhere. But you don't usually choke people unconscious like because there's tapping. So, but that was, that helped me. Like when it was real, oh my God, I went to sleep. That's not hocus pocus. You know, there's no George Dillman in that. So I was up for it. <laughs> <laughs> so... All of this is unfolding. You do your five classes, you go back home, you come back about six months later, and that's when you um, encounter or, or you come across Hegan. And Almost. I'm mean, sorry. I, I came across him on the last day of my first week. The first okay. five lessons I had, the fifth one was with Hegan. Okay, so, so that's, we made that's, when he, that's when you made the connection. And I gave him my, you know, it's my last day, so you give him your hat from Australia with a kangaroo on it and you give him a boomerang and, you know, you do all that kind of shit, just like a normal person. But that made an impression on him. So when I came back six months later, he remembered me. He remembered you. So he's leaving to Brazil in three days. Mm -hmm. Are you going mm -hmm. with him? Um, I, I tried to. I couldn't get a flight. So I had to wait for a week. So he beat me down there. And I, got, I don't know, when I went down Friday or something. So I arrive in Rio de Janeiro Airport. He's coming to pick me up. There's three guys walking through the airport with their bees on. <laughs> which it might seem normal now, but it was not normal. It's then. not normal. It's not it's normal. normal. It's not <laughs> normal. And Hegan's got his one of his pants rolled up, tucked into a knee guard. I mean, scruffy. You know, it's like they've just come off the mat. And it was, if I'm not mistaken, it was Hegan, Carlos Machado, his brother, yeah, and Hillion Gracie. I think it was wow. Hillion. Either Hillion or Hands. No, I think it was Hillion. So they all. That's who met me. And they picked me up and we went straight back to the mat because my arrival had interrupted their training. <laughs> and um, <laughs> we went to the mat and, and he said, put on a gi, there's one on the wall and let's go. And that's how it started. Wow. Mm. I'm listening to your story. And one, it appears to me like you're the luck luckiest cat in the world. People, yeah. people would pay millions to be in your position. And you are just there are you comprehending what is happening to you at this point are you comprehending that you are quote unquote hanging out with no. the guys who literally started jiu-jitsu like they are the ones who created everything for us no i didn't know that um and i can tell you the exact moment when i realized that when was that and it was a couple of years later i was at gracie baja which is, this is pre-franchise Gracie Bar. I mean, so, so there was just one room and everyone was in it. You know, Henzo, Half, Hyan, um, Hillion, Five Machado Brothers, uh, et cetera, right? So they're all in the one is, spot. Is this here in US or this is in Brazil? No, in Baja, in Rio de Janeiro. Rio de Janeiro, okay. Yeah. And I was sitting on the side of the mat 
waiting for class to start. We train three times a day, morning, lunch, and evening. I'm sitting on the side of the mat feeling sorry for myself. <laughs> and um, Henzo, Henzo Gracie was sitting next to me. And why that's relevant is because Henzo was one of only two people that could speak English in that academy. The other one was Carlos Machado. He spoke English and Henzo spoke English. Yeah. No one else spoke any English. And I didn't speak Portuguese. So Henzo is sitting next to me. Hegan's on the other side of me. And these people start walking in the door that were well-known. I think it was Amory Batetti, Fabio Gurgel. I'm not sure. There's some guys walking in and other people are going, wow, ooh, you know, I, I, I saw, I read the room and they were making a fuss about these people who were coming onto the mat. And that was not normal. I went, I turned to Henzo and I said, what's, what's going on? Is this a, what's, it's an unusual day. And he says, yeah. And I said, why? He goes, all these guys are champions. They're the best guys in Brazil. And I said, well, why are they coming today? And he points to Hegan next to me and says, to train with him. I look past Hegan. With who? I said. <laughs> he goes, with Hegan. I go, with this idiot? Like, what? <laughs> no, I don't understand what you're saying. And he goes, do you not know? And I go, no, what? <laughs> he goes, where the fuck you are? I'm sorry. No. I go, no. He goes, you peanut. And then he told me. Higgins like the top of his game in Brazil right now. These guys have all come because Higgins just come back from the States and wants to train. They've come to train with him. I go, with this guy? Okay. <laughs> so, I think that's a good answer to your question. Yeah. <laughs> that's fantastic that's a answer. Clueless. That's a phenomenal story. So, but now, so, so, so now, 20, 30 years later, you look back at a story like this as you're sharing this story with us. It has to feel very satisfying. And in a sense, even an element of luck has to be somewhere in there. I mean, again, yeah. there's millions of people training jiu-jitsu around the world today, and I bet you thousands are listening to, to this conversations and to this conversation, and they are like, damn, I mean, like, I would pay money to just yeah. shake their hand, and you are literally hanging out with all of these guys over there. It has to feel yeah. good in a way to, to be part of that history. Yeah, the thing, Thomas, about history is you never know you're in it until after. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, Napoleon, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, it, it's only when you look back, it's history. Yeah. When you're in it, it's just today, you know. And um, But you have to be, I mean, I think I, I am lucky and I got some stories that would that trump that by 100. Oh, um, wait. Then, in terms of then we don't care about this. Yeah, let's so tell us. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> if you ask me later on about Vajra Mushti yeah. and the Indian, then I'll tell you a story. That okay. You won't all, right. Let, all right. Let's finish this topic and we're going to transfer right over. Okay. <laughs> so I, I think you have to be receptive. You're like not receptive in a weird esoteric sense, but you have to be open. You just have to be open to put yourself in weird situations, be a little bit uncomfortable and be okay with that and be willing to change your plans, be be willing to have, an, have a strong opinion about something but hold it very lightly so that in the face of new evidence or new experience, you can drop it and then go a different way. So that kind of agility um, is, is there's a relationship between that level of agility and luck. So if you're staying on your tracks, you're not going to get a lot of luck. Right? So I think, you know, when we say lucky, yeah, I think I was lucky, but it was also the fact that I, I was open and very receptive to new experiences and I was op open to looking silly and feeling stupid and feeling inadequate and, you know, all of those things that go with being in a weird environment where you are not very good. Well, um, and, and, so, yeah. and correct me if I'm wrong, but you're talking about a level of vulnerability, right? You're putting yourself in the situations that are presented in front of you and you are mm -hmm. open-minded enough not to decline them, but actually accept them for what they are and live that experience at the moment of time 
hoping or trying to take some learning experiences from it, right? Am I following here, correct? That's perfect. Yes, exactly that. Is that how you view jiu-jitsu? Oh, yes. I mean, that's the biggest hurdle. That's, well, there's many hurdles, but that's one of the biggest hurdles that people face when they come to jiu-jitsu, as we all know, right? It's, yeah. it's you are not, if you're going to go in, if you're going in there thinking you're going to be looking good, it's not that. That's what Gary hopes. Looking good is an old Gary, Gary, ho- good Gary hopes for that every day. Well, I, you know, I don't remember who we were talking to, but they were talking about their first trip. I'm trying to look through the old episodes, but their first trip to Brazil and, you know, they they went by themselves. They were there for a week. Their first day of training, they wanted to go home. They were just like, this is, I can't, you know, I can't do this. But they couldn't go home. You know, they went back to the hotel. Uh, and they were like, I'm stuck here. I can't go anywhere. And, and they were literally stuck there. I don't remember why. They couldn't mm-hmm. get home. Um, so he was like, I'll just go back. I've got nothing else to do. And after going back, um, you know, he he. Obviously, he started seeing a little bit of progression, enjoying himself, and he ended up staying the whole time. He's been back multiple times since. I wish I could remember who it was. But was was there any of that for you when you were, when you got down there? Yes. Um, again, my first – like when you're on the mat and they say you're with Hickson or Hagen or, you know, any of those, John jacques or – Henzo was a purple belt. Was he a purple belt? I think. But any any of those guys, um, of course, I'm, I have no expectation. Well, I do. I, I expect to be dominated completely, and they can do what they want, right? You, yeah. You know, it's like if you're playing tennis with Pat Rafter or something. You, 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 you're not thinking about winning. You're just going, oh, I'm just glad, glad to be here. So it wasn't as impressive to be dominated by those black belts. What changed for me? is there was a purple belt female, my weight, mm-hmm. lighter than me. She tied me up, triangle choked me, <laughs> armbarred me. That's what made me go back to my hotel room and reconsider my life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so do you understand what I'm saying? You, do. So it was a, you, you just expected that those guys would beat you up. Sure. That I did not expect. I mean, that, that's not right. And I sat in my hotel room. I remember clearly thinking, if I had dug my thumb in her eyeball, <laughs> that would uh, she would have been. I'd do that shit to me. Uh-huh. And then I, I shook my head and snapped out of it and went, "What am I talking about? <laughs> All of my martial arts experience, and I'm reduced to I have to bite this person and stick my thumb in their eyeball to beat them. Is that it?" And then I went back and went, I need to learn this shit. I need to embrace it. So it was that that did it. It wasn't Hickson. It wasn't Hegan. It wasn't any of the black dots. It was the fact that I was beat up by a lighter female. (laughs) But but that's that's often but that's often one of those description of of jujitsu as a martial art, right? Is that that ability to manipulate weight, weight balance and mechanics where somebody who is even smaller and not as strong can really take advantage of these leverage points right and yeah. i think this is th- that's what you're talking about and 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 i'll tell you like we have few females here at the academy but like as i'm looking all around the world and i see some of some of those gals training they they scare me because they they have tools that us men don't have you know i think yeah. they do think differently but also you know the fact of you know being much smaller and finding small spaces that's 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 crazy. Yeah, I think. Well, it, I, well I was just going to say. I, that, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, in that time, it was. I think that second, the second trip, maybe I'm not sure, but I went. It was near Christmas, and I was. I went to um, Hegan, the Machados, and the Gracies. Their parents had um, apartments, like a penthouse apartment. They had property. They were wealthy, comparatively wealthy. They weren't lower class. They they didn't have jobs. No one had a job, but they had parents that had property. That's how it all was. And they had an apartment up there in um, Copacabana or something. I'm not. I can't be certain, but some, I think it was Copacabana. And I went there for New Year's. New I think it was either Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve. I, I forget. And I was sitting there, and everyone's in there having a chat. And I said, "They said, John. So what do you want to do here? You know, you, you went to BJJ. What's your goal?" And I said, 
<laughs> I said, I said, my goal, I want to be able to train to the point where I can beat Marcelo Bayring. <laughs> <laughs> who was in the room <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes it matter how did how did that work uh, out <laughs> well it didn't well he's now dead i mean right. he was shocked thank you yeah bad shit going on there but um that's what i thought yeah. and he i think it was hegan that or henzo or someone might have been henzo turned to me and says forget about marcelo Try to beat Danny Alla. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I was going to bring up Keith Kachuk was talking about like getting beaten by that girl. And you can either look at it one of two ways is I'm, I'm done. This sucks. It's not for me. Or I need, and his words were, I need to learn this magic. The same as you, you yeah. know? And, um, at, why is it so hard? Is it just ego for us to, to be able to accept that and, and not quit? Yeah. Uh, and it's it's harder for, it, for you know, back in those days. I would I would say that I'm fairly accurate if I said this: the the only people doing BJJ, meaning non Brazilians, like you know Americans and me and I don't know who else, but the only people doing BJJ were fighters. They were already martial artists. Yeah, you know, no normal people were walking into a BJJ man. Certainly not in America. No engineers and doctors and policemen and teachers. No, they weren't doing it. The only people who were walking in were people that could thought they could already do the business. And they were either going in there to test it out or they were going to uh, – have I lost connection? No, we're still no, here. We're still here. Can you hear us? Yeah. Sorry, I could put my glasses back on. Sorry. So the only people that were going in were people that thought they could fight. So they were either going to – you know, fill a little hole in their fighting game, like, oh, I need to work on my ground game, you know. They, they were doing that or they were going in there to test it out, test themselves out. So, so that's the only two types. So let me doing. let me ask you, which which group were you part of? Were you filling oh, the gap or were you testing it out? No, no, no. I wasn't testing anything. No, I wanted to uh, up my ground game. Did you – so let me ask you this as a follow-up. Did you think – as a martial artist with, with extensive experience with a stand up and wrestling and other things, I mean, it's not like you were a rookie at that. There, there wasn't like years of experience there. Did you think that jujitsu was a small missing piece, or did you realize the how large this system was in comparison to what you've known up to that point? I thought it was a small missing piece, a, a piece in the jigsaw puzzle. A quarter, a quarter of the jigsaw puzzle was missing. And then, and, a, and then decades later, is it still a quarter of that system or you changed your mind? It might be half. I mean, be, because it depends, right, on, Thomas, on what we're talking about. Are we yeah. talking about sport? We're talking about real fights. We're talking yeah. about pointy end of military uh, or law enforcement. I mean, then you're talking about there's knives and there's multiple guys. So it's not a complete it's not complete for that role. Yeah. You need to be able to shoot people and fight with a gun, you know? So it just depends on what, what you, you know, what, what the problem is. So if the problem is a one-on-one -on -one guy, it's, it's, it can be, it could be 90% of it. Yeah. Right? If the problem, if it's out in the street for self-defense, it might be one third um, so it, it depends on the specific problem. There's no generic answer. I can yeah, give and as to essentially what you're saying is rules of engagement. There's the same thing like saying, I mean, wrestler in a wrestling room is going to dominate any jiu-jitsu guy, but if the wrestler comes into jiu-jitsu mat, the tables will turn. I mean, it, it's all about rules of engagement and what we are surrounded by, essentially, right? Yes. So what, what... Go ahead. What's it like when you come back to Australia and start showing other people what's what's the reaction you're getting at that point um the, the same reaction i had with the girl denial. <laughs> anybody stick their thumb in your eye they tried <laughs> um so it took a while that was in you know to, we're, now we're talking about 1987 88 you know up to 90s um, and then I owned this magazine, so I, I, I put it articles and it was on the cover and I brought Henzo out 
and Carlos Gracie Jr. And we did some seminars around the place. And I thought everyone's just going to jump all over it. No, that didn't happen. It it was still too basement, niche, grassrootsy, and it wasn't appealing. It was only after the UFC happened in 92, I believe, 92 or 93. It's 93. 93. Was it 93? So it was only, and it wasn't immediately after that. It was only after it was proven that that it wasn't a fluke that grappling prevail, uh, you know, prevailed. So I'm going to say it was only after about three or four UFCs where then the martial arts community went, hang on, we should have a look at this. And then I would say it wasn't even until the 2000s and beyond that the normal public were coming in. Why do you think that happened? Why why do you think that Internet. the traditional but but that's not hold on that's not what I'm necessarily referring to. Why do you think that there was this resistance from a traditional oh. martial arts to have the acceptance of the new kid on the block essentially? Why 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 as humans we are so close-minded in a way where we need the proof. We we need the tangible you know, I need to touch this before I believe um, versus, you know, you showing people and people being more, more, more accepting of it. I think, I'm not sure. There's a few factors, I think. One is maybe martial artists, because they're fighting, maybe, I'm just total theory here, but maybe they're engaged in fighting, they're engaged in conflict. So maybe they are a little bit more skeptical about everything than the average person because they're fighting. So, so, you know, so in other words, they've got, they've got an instinct to push back, let's say. Mm -hmm. And if you've got an instinct to push back, well, that could be under a larger label, skeptic, skepticism. Yeah. So maybe yeah. they're all, I'm just guessing, right? It, it, someone's got to do a study, but uh, <laughs> there'd be maybe as martial artists, we're all just a bit more skeptical than the average person. I don't know. That would be one thing. But I think a larger part of the reason is much more simple. It's investment. The average martial arts person is already invested yeah. and people don't want it. They don't, they are reluctant to, and the longer they've made that investment and the more they've made into that investment, the more reluctant they are to go over there. Yeah. Um, you and, know, and, and, that, and that simply could, you know, perhaps in their mind that could underline the fact that, I wasted all the time that I've trained this martial art that I even invested into. And now I'm, I'm giving up because I'm accepting something new. I don't know. It's interesting thought that I've had on my mind for a couple of years is why are we so hesitant to accept new things? It's just in general as humans, you know, and it's so, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. Sunk cost, you know, you know, yeah. you've already put that. Yeah that in there it's reluctance to walk away i want to go over there now but i've already spent the 150 dollars on the on the fucking plane ticket from venice to rome but suddenly i've got another idea but i'm not doing it because i've got this stupid hundred dollar ticket to rome mm -hmm. tear it up and go to wherever like my wife and i do that all the time when we're traveling we actually um plan a thousand dollar budget every trip that we can just tear up throw away because we changed our mind on that day and that the price is a thousand dollars. The benefit is freedom and right. So there, I think it's you're right, Thomas. It's something about it's something around that as well. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely a head scratcher, you know. To well, first of all, to understand humans, that's a head scratcher for sure. And then especially if we dip into a bunch of crazy people who do martial arts like jujitsu. I mean, that's <laughs> a bunch of knuckleheads out there. But listen, jujitsu, <laughs> jujitsu is not the only thing that you've done, and and there are some interesting things that you mentioned a moment ago. I do want to dip into that. So t talk a little bit more because there is th th there is taekwondo. You have some wrestling. You have some karate. And correct me if I'm any wrong on any of this, but there is one fascinating thing. As I was getting ready for this conversation and doing a little bit of reading about you and what you've done. It, 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 please help me how you pronounce this because I've never done this. Vajra Mashti, is that am I correct on this? Mushti. Mushti? Vajra Mushti. Mashta Mushti. Mushti. Please explain to me what in the world is that? Okay. The first thing is 
right now, I get I get emails once or twice a year from people who know that I was over there doing that in India. And to be clear, it's dead. The art is dead. You won't find anything um, and you can't hope to go to India and train in it. The last surviving members of the clan, the family that did that, uh, passed away. But back in the day um, when I was in India, um, I'd heard about it before. You can read about it in Don Drago's excellent books, Asian Martial Arts and Martial Arts of the Indonesian Archipelago, which are two fantastic books in that library that you can probably see. Um, And they talked about Don Drago, who was in the Marine Corps in America, and he travelled extensively through Asia, writing at the at, on on the dime, you know, of the American government it was awesome, and he was a scholar, warrior scholar, really amazing historian, and he travelled extensively through Indonesia. So when I left Australian shores, I wanted to follow in his footsteps. My goal was, I'm going to go everywhere Drago went because I read those books; they were super inspiring. I'm just going to follow in his footsteps. So I went to Indonesia. I got stuck there for about seven years, but you know, my plan was to move on and do all this stuff. Eventually, in the mid '80s, I think, I went to India to check out the martial arts and train in India. They're very big on wrestling in the northern part of India. There's still Hindu. Um, Oh, sorry, other way around. Northern part has been influenced by everyone coming through it along the Silk Roads and all of that, Alexander the Great, uh, you know, and all of that stuff, Makedonsky. Um, they're coming through there and there, and that's very influenced by a lot of cultures, but the southern part was very Hindu, preserved. And um, so in the northern part, you're going to find mostly wrestling, you know, and Indians produce some great wrestlers, um, very good at wrestlers, do well in the Olympics and mm-hmm. all of that stuff. So... They got a wrestling culture in India. So I got into that. I was doing some wrestling there. Uh, but in in part of that journey, I went to the uh, Delhi, the New Delhi, which is the capital of India. Is it? Yeah, I guess it is. Um, the um, museum. And there was a well, the New Delhi State Reference Library looking for old books on martial arts of India. And there's an old book. It's over there. <laughs> um, that's all I'll say. <laughs> I do come from a prison colony. <laughs> and the this book is called the Mala Purana. Mala means wrestler or fighter, and Purana in Sanskrit means old or ancient. So I found this book, and luckily at the time the book was written, the English had colonized India and there was some rule about any new books being published had to have, I don't know, I'm making this shit up now, 20% written in English. So the preface of the book had 20 or 30 pages of English, which is unusual, right? There's no reason other than colonization. So that's what happened. I got this book. I'm reading wait, and I go, wait, wait, wow. wait, hold, hold on. Wait, 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 what, what do you mean by that? So if, if the book has 100 pages, 30 yes. first first 30 pages was in English and rest of it was in Hindu? Rest of it's in Sanskrit. Mm-hmm. That so that doesn't make sense. Well, that's what colonization okay, is all about. Never mind. Oh, yeah, yeah. You got my attention there. Okay. I can walk over and get the book if you want to see it. No, <laughs> no we believe I, you. I, I, I'm just saying I okay, fair enough. So unless you knew both of the languages, you were not reading the whole book. You were there were only four pictures in the book, so you're not. <laughs> there's four <laughs> Fair enough. photographs. My apologies. Go on. Got it. Okay. It's not a comic. <laughs> <laughs> so it's an old book. Yeah. There was only like I think 500 ever printed. Yeah. And I have one of them. <laughs> okay. So, um, in that book, what Budger it talks about. The book was called Mala Purana, but it's all about this art called Vajramushti, who had over 1,000 years of tradition and it's family. So it was a family called the Jesse Mullers. Jesse Muller. I'm, I'm probably not pronouncing it right. Uh, J Y E S T H I M A L L A, Jesse Muller family. And they were known as bodyguards to the princes. And there was billions of princes in India. They had little prince 
prince kingdoms all over the joint. So these people, that was their profession. You know, like Spartan, we, you know, that's our profession. Well, in India, it was the Jesse Mullers were their profession was they're the best bodyguards ever produced in India. Um, and these were days where there weren't any guns. So think about it. Um, and the Jesse Mullers in that family, if you're a male, they trained you in the art of Bhadramushti. And if you're a female, they trained you in the art of healing, fixing broken bones and shit, which you were going to get in training. So, it's, and it went for a thousand years and stopped in about 19, um, somewhere in the 90s, the last ones died. I met the last ones. Anyway, the art was about, it's MMA with a knuckle duster on the right hand. That's it. So MMA, kicks, punches, headbutts, elbows, submission holds, omoplatas, guard, the whole shebang, thousand years, work a few things out. So they had the whole package except they had a knuckle duster on their right hand, whack, whack, and you only win by submission. Describe knuckle duster. Just so for those, describe knuckle duster. For those who don't know what that is. Okay, that's weird. Uh, (laughs) So it's a, it's a, it's, it's, I've never had to do this. (laughs) It's a, 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 a a shape, a, a little, a shape of a little round shape that you put your four fingers through. Yep. And you know, it's usually nowadays you could buy them and they're steel. Yeah. Um, it's the a, odd bouncing uses them like Jeff Thompson. You, you keep one in your pocket. So if it really yeah. kicks off. Brass knuckles. That, you know, brass knuckles is what yeah, I like, right? Yeah. So they, yeah. they knock, they, you hit someone and they fall over. Yeah. Um, um, but these things traditionally were made out of carved buffalo horn. Oh, okay. Uh, and so that that's a pretty hardcore version of MMA. Um, and one of the four photographs in the book is an omoplata and the guy's got his hand up in the air ready to hit the guy in the back of the head because he's all tied up with the omoplata. It's pretty cool. So I went down, I, I got the book, and here's the weird story. I got the book. I want to do that. The book's written in 1940s, 50s maybe. I'm, I'm not sure. And all I've got is in the front side of the cover, it's got published by Baroda University. That's my hint. So I look up, where's Baroda University? It's in the state of Baroda, okay? So I get on a train, I go down there. There's 4 million people in that town. (laughs) I go to the university and I say, is anyone, you got a publishing department? They go, nah. Okay, so I walk outside and I say, can anyone speak English? Someone puts up their hand. I say, I'll give you 50 bucks. Hang with me for the day. Be my translator. Sure. Now I've got a translator. I said to him, and in the book, there's a picture of uh, two of the, these guys going at it, and they've got head shaven with a ponytail, little ponytail. Uh-huh. And historically, I knew enough about religious studies that in India, that would mean they're Hindu and probably worship Krishna, you know, like a Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. So I said, this is my only thing. I think I said to the guy, find the oldest Krishna temple in this city. And he goes, sure, let's do it. Ask a few people, taxi driver, next minute, we're there at the oldest temple. So I figure oldest temple, I'll find the oldest guy. Right. So he might know something that happened 50 years ago. So he finds the oldest guy in the oldest temple in the city. And I say, ask if they've ever heard of these guys, the Jesse Mala family, Bhadra Mushti, blah, blah, blah. He talks in Hindu. He goes, the other guy looks like he's not interested. He just points over the road like that, which I interpreted as go and ask somewhere else. And the guy said, he said, go over and I ask over there. So I walk over the road, I knock on the green door, and do you know (laughs) who opened it? I'm guessing. (laughs) The guy. Right. (laughs) The guy in the book. (laughs) I got no explanation for that. I mean, that is one in four million odds. I mean, I, I narrowed it down a little bit, but that's probably the most freaky 
luck you're talking about, Thomas. Yeah. That's, that's, that was my luckiest day, apart from when I met my wife. That was my second luckiest day in the history of my life. And he opened it and I opened the book and I looked like at him like that and he looked at the book and he went <laughs> and he <laughs> invited me in and I spent uh, a week with him. Wow. And he, he was probably in his late 60s, 70s, maybe in his 70s then, or maybe 80. He might have been 80. Yeah, yeah. He had a 65-year-old younger brother who was only a kid, so he was probably in his 80s. Start up everywhere, big man, cauliflower ears, and I went, oh, shit. And, <laughs> you uh, found him. <laughs> you found him. <laughs> you asked for it. And I was, I was blessed, you know, in – um, it was just amazing. And I spent that maybe, uh, I don't know, eight or nine days with them. And they taught me to, you know, to the, to the extent there was no classes or anything. It had all ended years ago, but they took me around the corner down a lane and there was this old door with a big old lock and a big giant brass key, like an Indiana Jones movie. And he opens up the lock and doors creak open and we go in, there's the wrestling pit and all these little knuckle dusters in little alcoves all around the corner that, belonged to famous fighters over the last thousand years. Holy I was just like, oh, shit. You know, I was like, that was just fantastic um, experience. Yeah. Wow. I was very lucky. Yeah. This. Go ahead. So as you, so as you going through these experiences, right, and obviously there is a large component of grappling involved in this, and then – you have these experiences with jujitsu. What are the big differences that you noticed between those two? Or maybe there aren't many. Well, I mean, are you are you wanting to include that Vajra Mushti? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you're specifically talking about that, please understand I did that before I did BJJ. Yeah, I know. So I, yeah. Right, so it was very difficult for me to know what I was looking at. Yeah. Like if you imagine that you haven't done BJJ and you're on the bottom and they're telling you to do Omo Plata on a guy with a knuckle duster. So that's like what? And and I didn't I didn't I thought it was awesome because of just the beauty of the history of it and yeah, it was clearly they were hard men and you know it was awesome, but I didn't I didn't give it. The, the credit it was probably due um, because I, I thought Omo, imagine seeing Omo Plata as your first technique. Mm-hmm. Like you're going to go, hey, you're not going to be able to do that to me. You know, so, um, and so they had a guard, but I didn't know guard existed. Now, after I learned some BJJ and I got to around purple belt or something, I thought, oh my God, they had a guard. Like, you know, Omo Plata's, I would love to go back there again. But of course, by that time it was all finishing up and they were probably ended. So um, who knows, Thomas, Gary, who, who knows over history, over the yeah. last 2,000 years, how many arts have come? It only takes one generation to not do it, and it's dead, and everyone has to start again. And that's one generation. That might be a famine. It might be a war. It might be a, uh, an in, uh, colonization or something that just stops it dead, and now it's all going to be reinvented from scratch. So we're in a new age now because we've got the internet, so things are preserved forever, presumably, right? So it's um, it was a different time, and I can't tell you, who knows, how many times Omoplata has been invented over the last 3,000 years or 5,000. But let me ask you let me ask you a similar question, but from a different approach. Jiu-Jitsu is continuously going through evolution and it's continuously changing, even if we talk about 20 or 30 years ago or, you know, when you were training, you know, at that day in Brazil, right there. Jiu-Jitsu back then is very different to what Jiu-Jitsu to, is today. And many, many do think that no-gi grappling will suppress the more traditional gi Jiu-Jitsu. Right, wrong, we don't know. Well, future will tell. However, I'm curious, with the thought that you just presented, that it takes only one generation for an art to completely stop, do you think that that's possible? Do you think that it's possible that certain areas of jiu-jitsu will completely disappear as this evolution continues for the future? It's an interesting question. I think it would be difficult now because the world's just so connected and archived. Yeah. You know, 
things are archived now and yeah. they're, so it's hard, but they weren't back then. So it was just, you know, so much stuff's been lost. Um, but I think now it would probably be difficult because of the internet, you know, and even if it goes down a certain route, say it all just turns no gear, there'll always be someone who wants to, a little niche group that I want to preserve the old way of doing with the gear. They're, just like there are with, an, what's it called, anachronistic, you know, the sword, you know, they dress up as knights. I mean, so there'll always, I think there'll always be something there. But we've also got footage, you know, there's endless amounts of stuff on the internet. And, mm-hmm. It's, so defi- it's definitely easier to find the material than going to India and look, you know, yeah. with one book <laughs> and finding the door. I, I'm with you. Yeah, that's definitely much. Speaking of books, how many books do you have behind you? Your library is very impressive behind there. <laughs> I'm trying to impress. <laughs> <laughs> I could have had it. your face in the garden. Uh, <laughs> either one. No, I, I've got a small amount of books now. I don't know, a couple of hundred books, but I used to have many more. But I was where I used to live was um, burnt out in the late 80s or in the early 90s when a bushfire. And so I lost everything. So it's a start again kind of thing. But yeah, I've got a good book collection. Good for you. Good for you. So as this martial art journey continues, you know, we can't skip the fact that you are one of the Dirty Dozen. I'm wondering if you can share the story when that became a moment, that pivotal moment when you were rewarded the black belt, when that moment came. Did you know? Was it a surprise? Did you think that, you know, that was what you were supposed to get or you were not ready for it? I mean, share your thoughts on that. Um, That was in 1997, the early part of 1997, to be clear, because I've been kicked out of the Dirty Dozen a couple of times. (laughs) (laughs) That seems to be the stories with everybody we say. (laughs) They are in and out, in and out. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. because some people make outrageous claims. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's let's, 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 let's get the record straight. Are you or are you not Dirty Dozen? Let's just... I am am 100 (laughs) And, and in fact, um, the but I don't mind it. You know who coined that phrase? I did. That was yes. I, I was the one that came up with the name, and it was just an off the cuff remark in an interview or something. It was just oh yeah, one of the dirty dozen, you know, because I probably just watched the movie. So it was just an <laughs> off the cuff. But it, it 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 became a thing. Like it's weird. It is a thing. And I, it's like Bitcoin. So. <laughs> <laughs> There was a perceived value, and then people were prepared to bullshit to be part of it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I was, yeah, I got my black belt in early part of 1997, Um, and and I I did not know I was going to get the black belt. Um, I I went down to the mat that day, and on the mat was David Meyer, who's one of my very dear dearest friends, who's a black belt. Um, I taught David his first BJJ lesson, but he got his black belt before me because he was on the spot. I was uh, out in Australia. So I'm, you know, I was, I wasn't there when other guys got graded. I happened to be away. So I was always lagging by a year or something, even though I'd been training maybe five years longer than them, mm-hmm. you know, cause I was remote, right. Compared, well, remote from an American point of view. Um, and I don't live in Austria. It's Australia. Um, so- <laughs> Because you guys don't do geography in school. We I, um, listen. <laughs> <laughs> so I, so David Meyer was there, and he knew, but I didn't know. So I was a purple belt when I taught him his first lesson. He always looked at me as his coach. So we kind of went along, and but I, I turned up. David's there. And there were a few other black belts there, and there, well, almost all the black belts. Bob and and where and where is this? Where, where are you at? That's it. Uh, that was in Redondo Beach. Okay in Los Angeles, and there was Hegan Machado, John jacques Machado, Johnny Machado, Roger Machado. Carlos Machado wasn't there. He was over in Texas um, yeah, on, on the set of... Hanging out with Chuck. Right. So there was four of the Machado brothers and, and all the other old school, old school crew. And, um, yeah, Hegan gave a speech, and I'm looking around thinking... Who were the other brown bots? Well, there wasn't many. It was like me, I think. Um, and yeah, he took his own black belt off and wrapped it around my waist. So he gave me his own belt, which was extraordinarily wonderful. 
And um, I don't wear it. Obviously, it's in a, up in my school. But um, and that's what happened. And well, yeah, so- I got my black belt. But I didn't think I deserved it. To answer a part of your question, no, because see, they they imagine imagine that you learn tennis and there's Federer and I don't know who else. I don't follow tennis, but you know they're all there, and that's your norm. So you're not gonna. I mean, I didn't feel I was up to that level. Um, I railed against every belt. Every time they said, time for your purple belt, I went, no, 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 just give me another year. And I fought tooth and nail against every rank. But I had to eventually accept them. And, um, yeah, so. Walk me through through your mind that moment when this is happening. So you get to the academy, no more training session, nothing extraordinary. You know, you're sitting around and, and boom, it happens. Your name gets called or, you know, you, you, it's happening right now. What, what's going through your mind? Is this real? Like, are you, are you comprehending what, what in the world is happening right now? The black belt is getting tied around your belt. It's not, only, it's not, it's not a black belt. Let, let, let's frame this <laughs> in. Hegan. This is Hegan's black belt is getting tied around your waist. It was surreal. And, and be, because I was never thinking about belts. Right. I, I never thought about belts. I, I've never thought about goals, like like make a million dollars, like owning a house, like getting a black belt. I've never thought about that. Those things have all come as a consequence of doing things. And it was the process of doing things and immersion in that process to the point where you're immersed in it and then you blow past the million dollar goal, the one house goal. You just blow past them and you look up and go, oh my God, when did I pass that goal? Way back because you're not, fo- I think focusing on the goals is a little mistake. A, not a little, a big mistake. Yeah. Because then you're not focused on the process, which is where you should be yeah. at. So um, people focus on the goals and they miss all the opportunities on the sides. They miss all the agility, the, uh, and, and, and they're not living now. So I think you focus on the process and then the goals just happen as a consequence in the same way that a bee runs around and it thinks it's collecting honey, but it's cross-pollinization happens as a result of what the bee's doing. It's not the bee's focus. Well, I'm, and so um, I was never about the rank. Weirdly today, some people are. That's a strange thing to me. It's about the training and the rank happens as a consequence. And that was one of those moments. Oh my God, what? Black belt? When did that happen? It was kind of like that. But but it never it has never crossed your mind when you're training or sitting back after training or maybe, you know, relaxing at home is like, you know, one day this black belt might be around my waist. That thought never crossed your mind. Never. So in that case, that moment had to be even more extraordinary for you. Yeah, it was surreal. Well, this, this, this to me sounds the exact same way you've lived your life. You're, you have your $1,000 to tear up. You have your, uh, book, your uh, stolen book that you're going you're gonna to find these people and learn this art, um, and you're not, you're not focused on you know, we, we're talking a lot today about coincidence and it, and it's not coincidence. It's you're, you're, you're going out and setting this path and these things come to you because of it, because of the decisions you're making and the way you're moving through your life. And I, I to me, it seems, um, and maybe I'm wrong, but it seems like that's all intertwined, whether it's, you were talking about your black belt or we're talking about your travels with your wife, or we're talking about the history you've learned and, and the places you've been. Yeah, Gary, that's right. I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give that advice to people because it's a little. I'd be concerned that it'd be irresponsible, but it has worked really well for me in every facet of my life. Not just so; it's not like one lucky thing. It's being open, agile, willing to fail, all of that. No goals, or I'll say fuzzy goals. Fuzzy, meaning that I, 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 I know a direction, like a compass. I'm going to go north, but I'm not straying true to it because there might be a lake in the way. I've got to go around it. So mm-hmm. I, but I know I need to go that way, and then the terrain, as we're walking on it, will tell us which where to put our feet 
moment by moment, like something like that. And I actually, I do a lot of hiking in the wilderness, and that's precisely what I do. I don't follow a trail. We don't do trails in Australia. <laughs> that's funny. Um, <laughs> so, so they do in America. They're awesome at it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> there we do. <laughs> And it's beautiful, um, but we don't do that. So, uh, yeah, so fuzzy goals, there's a direction, the, the, the directionality, but then the day-to-day slash terrain will tell me how to act. And I've we've done that. And we've done well with that. You know, we're independently wealthy. We haven't needed money for years. Uh, good enough money for a couple of generations. We don't care about that shit. So that's great because we don't have... We don't do things for that reason anymore. If we're doing anything, it's because we love it. We want to contribute. Um, so we're doing things for the right reasons. Um, and, you know, we meet great people um, and we just have wonderful experiences. So, yeah. But I, I wouldn't want to be a career advisor and say that to every kid. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I you, think more people need to hear it. You've traveled a lot. I mean, a lot is probably under a statement here. But you, you've been around. You've seen a lot. You've seen a lot of jiu-jitsu. Let me narrow this down specific to jiu-jitsu, grappling, and maybe perhaps even martial arts. If there was a one place, one story, one day, one pivot point that really stuck in your mind and narrowed down to only one, is that something surfacing up in your mind right now? That made the biggest impact, the one that you remember? It's very difficult because there's just been so many. Yeah. There's a hundred. So, you know, if, if you could tether it to something, I, I could narrow it down. There's, there's too many. The biggest I mean, impact on the mat that oh. made in your life. There you go. I'll, I'll rephrase. Hold on. I'll rephrase. The one time when you got smashed the most. <laughs> there you go. Th- this has to be much easier. <laughs> yeah, I was getting to a couple, but you narrowed it down to five or six. But that getting smashed the most would be well, you can be smashed in a lot of different ways. True. Right. I mean, so you can be just totally dominated, but, but come out like feeling fine, or you can be smashed and there's blood and bits missing. Which one? <laughs> Tell us both. I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to pick because I don't know which one's better. <laughs> uh, you know, you know what was easy? A lot of the challenge fights, people coming in in the early days wanting to test out BJJ and the purple belts. When I was the purple belt, we had to step up and take a lot of these guys on. And that was easy. That, that, that were, none of those were hard. That were really simple. You, are you talking about the yeah, challenges? Well, are you talking about the challenge days or when, when somebody came into the DKM to challenge? Chris Howard talked about those mm-hmm. <laughs> quite a bit. They were all like, they were always easy. Like that wasn't hard. The training, just the grind was it hard. I mean, Cesar Gracie was another guy. Cesar and I used to he was one rank higher than me. When I was a purple, he was a brown. When I was a brown, he was a black. So he was like, we'd always roll and there was, we always bleed every single time there'd be blood coming out of somewhere. So it was like a cat fight. Um, okay. I've got a fight. So, so here's the thing. So Cesar and I, every time we wrestled, cause we're in the same Academy, there was blood cause we we're both fighters and like go at it. And I don't think I ever beat him. I, I, I wasn't tapping him. And he would tap me maybe once in a roll, you know, so he was better, right? And, um, but it was always blood and it was a fight. And then he, he can pull me over after Caesar left one night and he said to me, John, do you want to beat Caesar next week? And I go, sure. And I thought he was going to show me some technique. And he goes, you just, you promise me you'll do what I tell you to do. I go, of course. He goes, you've got to fight at 50% of the pace. Drop your pace down 50%. Go conversation mode, not debate mode, or not points on mode, right? So different levels of sparring. Mm-hmm. So 
I said, are you crazy? He could, like, if I go lower, I'm going to get smashed worse. He goes, shut up. You told me you would just do it. Oh, I said, all right. I turn up to training. Cesar and I line up. Bam! He comes like a out of a cannon. And I just chill out, relax, thinking I'm going to get beaten badly. But I wasn't. I wasn't. I, I forget. I forget, Thomas, the the exact match, but I didn't tap any more than normal. So I'm going to, I'm going to guess I tapped one time and then, but I'm fresh because I'm only traveling at half the pace. Mm -hmm. Caesar's going normal pace. Then thanks Caesar. He goes to leave. Hagen says, no, stay right there. We go again. I forget what happened. Let's say the same. Cesar says, thanks, goes to leave. Hegan says, no, stay with John. We go again. I'm fresh. He's dead. Now it's even again, again. And then I tapped him. And then I tapped him. I hadn't learned one technique. All I'd learned was pacing. And that's that was a pretty memorable moment for me. <laughs> right. And no disrespect to Cesar, he's, he was wonderful back then. And he was very friendly and very nice to me as an English. He was in America. He was an American, really. He was a cousin. Um, but, yeah, many, that was pretty cool. Man. Many consider jiu-jitsu being more mind-stimulating and more strategic approach or more strategic martial art than a physical approach. Would that moment be somewhat a definition of that? Yeah. I mean, and the proof is I didn't learn anything new. Yeah. Right. And, and the outcome changed. So if I didn't learn anything new and the outcome changed, the only thing that's left is the way you think about it. Yeah. Yeah. And so strategy became what there's, there's a, I've got, I can gauge, I can, you know, this is pretty good. <laughs> I don't have to pound them into the ground every time. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah. so I tasted a, a little victory, a minor victory, but, Wow, things but, can change. But this had to be a big learning curve for you, just mentally acknowledging that. Yeah. 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 What a phenomenal. I mean, listen, I'm going to keep, yeah. keep asking you questions, but like we, we, we've been at this for over an hour and I do want to be respectful of your time. But listen, before we start wrapping this up, one of the things that we do end of every episode, and we didn't tell you this, so this is a surprise, but our previous guest asked a question that will ask you, but he had no idea that you are going to be the guest. Matter of the fact, there was a very nice connection between our previous guest and you, and Gary's going to take a lead at this. It's going to create a nice wrap-up to yeah, this Yeah, this is great, because this is from uh, Jay Zabellos, uh, who is a Jean-Jacques um, black belt, and um, mm -hmm. he wants to know, let me make sure I get this right, the 10th degree red belt is reserved for Carlos and Helio. Will we see anyone else get it? Wow. You're, you're asking the probably the worst person because I care nothing. About <laughs> <laughs> I think even uh, though he, even though he didn't know that you will be answering yes. it, he, yeah, he, he strategically didn't know it was you, placed, but, but yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't, I'll, I'll give you proof. I mean, right now I'm a sixth degree. I got my sixth degree right. two years ago or something. But in my academy, my certificate's on the wall, fourth degree. And my son the other day, Dad, when are you going to change that? I go, I don't give a shit about that. No one cares. <laughs> so um, I, I think the people that care too much about that, are just they're, they're focusing on the wrong thing, right? Like, as if it means, like, look, no disrespect to anyone, but as if it means it's not going to make any difference to anyone's life. If they get a seventh degree certificate, an eighth degree, does it give them more students? Does it make their marriage better? Is it improving their training? In Tell me in what way that makes their life better. None. <laughs> so I, I just not up for it. But now I get it. Like I'm very happy at the same time to see Hegan, Jean-Jacques get their eighth degrees. I'm happy because of course, right? I mean, as the community, we should uh, acknowledge these people who give us some. I don't care. 
And I, I don't know the answer to the question. I don't know whether anyone will ever get that. I think it should. I I guess it, it, if the question is, should they? Yes, they should. Because, you know, if Hallio, I mean, if you read Robert Drysdale's book, for yeah. example, um, opening the closed guy, if you, then, then, you know, the, the history that we all have of jiu-jitsu is all very myopic. You know, it's all yes. from our personal perspective and it can be very different. So I have this very skewed view of, oh, Helio Gracie, because I've, I've done some training with him, you know, on the mat. Like, so I have this Helio Carlos, this very, this lineage, but plenty of other people have just as, um, what's the word? you know, correct, you know, just a just as legitimate a lineage, but from a completely different line. So who's making all the contributions? All kinds of people are making contributions. And this is the wonderful thing about BJJ. A white belt can make a contribution, right? If it works and we adopt it, it can make a contribution. Everyone can contribute. So I don't think it should be just those people because of their name uh, are the only ones that it's like royalty, you know? Really, Prince Charles? You got to be joking. So, <laughs> I mean, um, no, I think I think it's, if the answer is will they? I don't know. Should they? I think yes. I I think one day the Machado brothers. Now that's my personal, you know, biased, skewed perspective, but they should be uh, uh, eligible for that for the contribution they made and and their own levels of excellence in what they do, they should be, that should not be denied to them or anyone else for that matter. Well, yeah. as you mentioned, as you mentioned a bit ago, you know, the history, the big part of history is that it has to take place in the future and we have to kind of pass that point. So the only way yeah. really to find this out is to stick, around. stick around long enough <laughs> 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 to know what's going to happen. Um, in the words of Leonardo DiCaprio. Stay <laughs> <laughs> Professor, um, you know, one, I, I really, really do appreciate you spending last hour or so with us and sharing some of the not only funny, entertaining, but also deep stories and your experiences, you know, on and off the mat. What a phenomenal life that you've had up to this point and, and so much ahead of you. Um, really, really do appreciate you being here. Yeah, absolutely. I, before we wrap it up, um, where can people find you? I'll take that from Thomas. Okay. This is usually his thing. But where, if people wanted to connect with you or find you, um, how, how would they go about it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, I guess BJ. This is proof that I've been around for a little time. My website's bjj.com.au, Australia. Uh huh. Not Austria. Um, on Facebook, I, I try to post every day on Facebook, you know, a little post about something, not just what my wife made me for dinner, but something meaningful <laughs> every day or two. Um, so they can find me on Facebook pretty easy. Or, you know, or as I said, my sites, uh, my, my website for our association out here is bjj.com.au. And my academy is called Red Cat Academy. Red Cat Academy. Dot com dot au. Beautiful. By the way, how on Instagram or TikTok or whatever the hell else. Wait, they wait do. a minute. You're not on TikTok. <laughs> what, what are you talking about? I don't even know what it is. <laughs> I don't mean either. <laughs> how, by the way, you know, before we wrap this up formally, how, how is Jiu Jitsu in Australia? You guys doing good over there? Are you staying out of trouble? We're doing good. Australia's, you know, I mean, it's it's coming to its own. Um, Lachlan Giles, you probably heard of him. Oh, yeah. He was oh, yeah. Black belts. Um, I mean, there's a lot of, I've got probably 200 black belts now that I've produced over the years, which is a big privilege. And we've got a big organization with a lot of people that I haven't tried to promote. It's just grown organically. I had no plans to grow the organization, but it just happened. Um, because when you do things the right way and treat people well and don't charge them thousands of dollars, then weird things happen. Great things happen. So, so it's grown. There's probably 90 something schools now in our association all over Australia. So that's, that's a lot of black belts teaching and, um, and some of them have gone to the world stage and into the UFC and all of that stuff. So yeah, it's, it's, it's Australia's very good. Yeah. Good for you. Good for you. That's Thank you. You, you ever come to us, visit the, 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 the country of, of us here? I was in New York at Christmas time. That was awesome. Yeah. Well, you got to come to Chicago. I'm just saying. Chicago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's where we are. 
Okay. <laughs> my son would love to do that. My kid would love to do that. All right. Well, let's wrap this up formally. Once again, thank you for being here. We love the stories. We'll be watching all this unfolding in the future, and hopefully we'll stick around to find out what's going to happen as, as this evolution of jiu-jitsu continues and, um, and this beautiful art continues growing all around the world. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I can't think of a better way to spend my Valentine's Day, right? <laughs> don't let, no, don't let Margaret hear that. Uh, there you go. But seriously, we have, you know, we're we're eight or nine episodes into the year, um, and I can guarantee that um, when we do the 2023 wrap up, that this one will be right up there as one of our favorites. So thank you so much for uh, your contribution here today. I re really enjoy it. Thank you so much, Professor. Oh, have a great evening or a great day. Yeah. 17 hours <laughs> ahead into Wednesday. Um, thanks again for being here. Let's wrap this up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Raw Radio. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review and help us make the show even more amazing. For future episodes, check out our website and follow us on all major podcast platforms. Take care. Mm -hmm.